All right, all. Good morning. Sorry that we're doing this so early. Um, this is early for me on a Saturday. I imagine it's even earlier for you on a Saturday, Andy. <laughs> um, and our poor Portland uh, and <laughs> West Coast folks probably can't even join. Um, so, uh, but that's because convention's starting early. So anyway, this again is days two and three of convention debates for the DSA. Uh, my name's Haley, I'm with Tempest um, and Afro Socialist Caucus. I'm here with Andy. Uh, hey, I'm Andy. I'm also in Tempest. And uh, we have two days to recap now, so we're going to just get right into it. Um, Andy, take us away. So, um, uh, all right. So, Sunday night we um, we had our first um, day of the convention and all the business, which uh, we went through the last time we we talked, but ended up with no agenda for the convention and that would all have to be taken up on Thursday. Um, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, were all workshops and panels and things like that. So no actual convention business happened um, between Monday or Sunday and Thursday. Uh, but what's actually important was that a lot of things did happen in the in the in-between. Um, nothing that was official convention business, but um, but uh, for the NPC race, um, some people that were in the collective power network dropped a letter um, citing a whole bunch of, um, um, I don't know, issues and like, uh, and stuff that had happened between members and collective power and then asking people not to vote for, for people that were running for NPC because of it. Um, and so as a result, um, three different people dropped out and then a fourth dropped out and then came back in, um, all related to this, to this letter. Um, and then on Thursday, right before the convention began, the NPC made a ruling stating that um, there was an active grievance. And so they were also going to bar the fifth candidate from that slate. Um, so they made it a determination that Kara would not be allowed to run because of the grievance. Um, so, so all of these people were running on the renewal slate. So now there were five candidates initially, um, then uh, three of them resigned, another one resigned, came back, and then one was barred. So going into Thursday, four of the five were, were um, dropped out of the race. So the uh the convention on thursday started um there was um, some reports by by committees just about what they've been doing um nothing really of note um and then um there was like a, a very brief speech by india walton who just um won the democratic primary for mayor of buffalo um, then uh, we moved into the actual beginning of business on it for Thursday. So again, the whole thing that we had to do was come up with the agenda and um, and then start actually convening. Um, so the chair opened with a moment of silence for Richard Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO who, who had just passed. And then immediately into that, um, somebody made a motion that the NPC's ruling to bar Kara from running be uh be lifted so uh so that was the first thing that happened that took about a half an hour to resolve and um <clears throat> i it's the decision was 726 to 333 so kara was i think reinstated is that right yeah okay and then we actually started moving into stuff um, again. Uh, somebody tried to rule that the NPC's um, recommendations to the convention were out of order, but that um, was, you know, that was chucked also. So um, most of the business then is all about um, shifting around the agenda. So the convention itself has a proposed agenda from the convention committee but the delegates have to decide whether they accept it and can move it around. So there's a whole lot of jockeying that goes on. And this is the same that's happened at the last two conventions also. So this took a whole bunch of time. Um, and eventually um, we ended up 
with an agenda about two hours into the night. I think there was only four and a half, five hours that were scheduled for the day. Um, so the the big issue I'd say for the day that that was really um, where all of this was leading up to was the consent agenda. So again, if you don't know what the consent agenda is, it's a package of a bunch of different proposals that get voted on together. Um, and they took a poll to decide what, uh, what people had high support of. And if they had more than two thirds support, that would go into this package of, of goods called the consent agenda. There would be no debate on it. And then if it gets a simple majority, then everything in that agenda would pass. So on Sunday, um, what we talked about was that um, initially the rules stated it would be 10% to pull something out. Um, and then the convention committee changed that to a third without telling anybody. Um, so there's already some jockeying around about this um, and people wanted, uh, made a bunch of procedural motions to, to kind of get around the fact that the, the whole issue was around resolution 14, which is international socialist solidarity, which committed DSA to building relationships with um, ruling parties in Latin America and the pink tide, and also to join the Sao Paulo forum. So um, I guess the way that I would characterize it is there's a lot of attempts to just foreclose that debate and just pass it without even talking about it. So, um, so the threshold was the first kind of thing about trying to make it hard to pull it out. And then we get to the actual consent agenda. And the first thing out the door is that someone calls the question to try to make sure that there's no motions to pull anything out and that we immediately vote on it. Um, so that took even more time. It failed. And so then something got pulled out, which was um, the YDSA resolution. Then uh, after that, someone called the question again to try to stop the R14 thing from coming out. That failed. And then, uh, then R14 does get pulled. Um, so we immediately then move into debating resolution 14 and then the YDSA one. Um, and I'll hand it over to Haley. Yeah, so before we talk about uh, day three, I want to talk a little bit about the significance of this debate. Um, obviously, if you joined us last time, you know that this is something that um, Tempest uh, has been very active in, um, trying to make sure that this didn't make the consent agenda, um, as uh, that is uh, R14 specifically on international solidarity. Um, and also um, in alliance with a number of other groups, um, some folks from Bread and Roses, some folks from, uh, you know, different parts of DSA who actually might have in fact been in support um, of uh, the resolution, but wanted to hear what this debate underlying it had been. Um, and so I think what the significance was, is that there was a, um, assumption that this was just being raised by a very small minority and that this was being, um, this was sort of the point that was hammered home multiple times that only a small minority wanted to have this debate and therefore it was irrelevant and should be in the consent agenda. To me, what a consent agenda is, is it's the items that we have um, broad consensus on and that there actually isn't any significant debate on um, at all. Um, the idea that people tried to multiple times prevent this from getting out of the consent agenda to have a debate to me speaks to the fact that there wasn't actually a desire to have debate on the part of people who support resolution 14. Um, on the other hand, it also the fact that it actually got out and that people voted um, in sufficient numbers to make that one third uh, threshold to actually have the debate, I think was incredibly good. It's actually, uh, not something that happens uh, super often that we get to have debates on really any kind of significant question. And this was going to decide for the next two years what our international work was going to look like. Um, the objections to this were broadly about um, the fact that within the Sao Paulo Forum, but even more so within the context of the resolution saying that we're going to be uh, allying ourselves with mass parties, it actually 
narrowed what was previously agreed on in previous conventions, which is that we would be allying ourselves with a broad array of forces on the Latin American left or on the left more broadly. Um, the other problem with that is that by specifying mass parties um, and also with the history of the International um, Committee, which put forward this convention, um, meeting with Maduro, um, not meeting with opposition in Venezuela, um, if this is actually the trajectory of this resolution as passed, then it would mean putting ourselves um, in uh, alliances with parties that have enacted austerity, parties that have opposed LGBTQ rights, parties that have um, actually allied with US imperialism in various ways, um, and uh, parties that have uh, opposed uh, abortion rights. So. Um, and there's no space for actual criticism within that, I think. You know, the question is um, not, are we counterposing solidarity um, with the international working class to supporting US imperialism? I think that it's pretty clear that that's a very facetious argument and that anybody who's opposed um, to US imperialism uh, is not, uh, is basically, um, that people who oppose US imperialism are not necessarily then therefore in alliance with these ruling parties. I think it's possible to both be against what the ruling parties are doing to ally ourselves with um, worker struggles against some of the things that the working part uh, that these ruling parties are doing, regardless of whether they call themselves socialists. Um, and to actually be um, against US intervention. Those two things are not counterposed. Um, however, I think part of um, the fact that this was taken out shows that there was a more than a, a small minority that actually wanted to have this debate. Um, the other thing uh, is that the resolution did in fact end up passing, which is not surprising per se, um, and it passed um, by a significant number, about the same number who opposed um, uh, taking it out of the consent agenda voted to pass it, and the same number who voted to take it out um, voted against Resolution 14. Um, so I think the question going forward is, what are the um, bases on which we have to actually build an, an internationalism from below that allies with those people going forward. And I think we have a stronger basis um, than would have otherwise been shown if we simply categorized these as minority debates and didn't actually have the debate out in the open. Uh, the only things I'd add to that is um, like the, the whole argument on, on Sunday and throughout the week leading up to this consent agenda was that people that were against this were an insignificant minority, this whole thing everybody already agrees on. There's no point wasting our time. Like, why are we even like entertaining fringe ideas, uh, which I think is extremely harmful, right? Um, it, it, it completely dismisses the any, any dissent from the existing, um, from whatever is going on, right? It just says like, we are already right. There's like, there's no debate that's going to happen. Um, and this this plays out in two arenas, right? One of them was about the NPC where it was, um, do we wanna have a system to vote for people that's going to bring political representation like of, uh, of any significant minority currents, right? That's the single transferable vote. And there's all kinds of problems with STV, but in, in a nutshell, that's what it does. And then the other one was, um, whoever can rally broad support, right, which is about cohering the center. Um, so that's the one. And then on the other, you have this this whole debate around should we even entertain anything around um, this internationalism resolution? And I think that um, really the, the significance of pulling this thing out and then voting on it was a third of the organization does not agree on this, which is very significant, right? Like the way that this was being painted was it was like, there's 10 people who hate this and they're super loud and we need to, you know, why are we entertaining them? No, an entire third of the organization says that there is something that we, we don't like about the way this is framed. Um, and, and that should be reflected in, in the work that we do as DSA. Um, and if we shut that out, then I think we become a much weaker organization. 
Yeah, I'll just add very briefly before moving on to the next that I also think in general, the questions, uh, the, the, the debates on the other side are that this would basically take up too much time, um, that, you know, it's not something that we should devote time to. And yet the accusations on the other side not necessarily in the context of the convention debate, but in the uh, Slack channels and you know the very robust debate that was happening over Slack. Um, some people were saying, you know, this is the question of do we side with U.S. imperialism or do we side with the CIA against popular movements, which is such a serious accusation. Again, I think incredibly facetious um, and ill-spirited. But the fact of the matter is. If those are the stakes, then we should be having this debate. That is actually a very serious debate to be having. Um, so I think um, the questions um, of like, what should a convention be for? It shouldn't be for us to not have debates. It's actually one of the few forums that we have to have debates about any important questions. And so, you know, I actually question the whole idea of a consent agenda sort of being the way that we can really uh, figure out what it is that is or isn't um, important for us to discuss. That should actually be based on not just a poll of people, but like, what are the key questions of the day? And what are the key questions that are facing the left um, going forward, because for the next two years, we should be figuring out what that means about international questions, what that means about labor, what that means about being in solidarity with the mass uprising that happened last year. You know, there are any number of very, very big questions that exist. And if there are questions about it, we should actually be finding ways not to suppress that debate, but to highlight it, regardless of whether it's a minority. I would love to see a convention where we call on people who have debates so that we can actually hear them out in the open rather than it being such a big struggle to even hear them. Um, and I mean that for people, whether they agree with me or not, I actually think that that gives people a stronger basis on which to vote in the first place. I mean, so with that said, oh, sorry, go ahead. Andy. Well, I, the, yeah, I mean, like the, the, the real like um, unsatisfying part of all this was that Thursday we spent four and a half hours dealing with procedural stuff right, moving around agendas, trying to call the question to close out the debate, four and a half hours, this debate on resolution 14 was 15 minutes long, right, and for something that's going to determine the course of DSA's international work for the next two years, I think that's wholly, like, it's just not um, sufficient, so um, it sucks, but that's what happened, and, um, and, you know, I'm glad that that we did get to have the debate at all, but but it's something to, to take stock of. Absolutely. So uh, I'm going to now talk about day three of the convention. Um, so and by day three, I mean day three of debates. I know it's been longer than that. So day three of debates uh, was Friday. Um, and basically, we went right into discussing um, the constitutional amendments that have been proposed and any amendments to those amendments that have been proposed. Um, the first one was CB1 to strike regional requirements for national conventions, meaning that we would no longer have a clause in the constitution that says the convention has to change uh, location every time. Um, and uh, basically that it would be based instead on the costs or based on you know, what would be most expedient. So that I think was pretty uncontroversial. Um, uh, there was an amendment to that amendment, um, which basically um, limited some of the more specific language um, uh, about what those requirements would be, but still sort of kept the spirit of the resolution intact. And ultimately that ended up passing um, with the amended language um, and was adopted. So in CB5, um, which was uh, a Tempest proposal for a leadership elected by and accountable to its members, that would um, do four things. It would um, basically make, uh, make it so that the NPC, uh, if there's a vacancy that arises, would be elected um, not by appointment, but by a vote of the members. Um, it would make uh, uh, timelines for minutes and uh, for, uh, for the NPC minutes to be released um, and any votes taken so that that's transparent to members. It would make um, it so that ghost committees don't exist. In other words, if the NPC creates a committee, it doesn't just kind of exist floating there um, without actually going into practice. 
um, and being populated within a certain timeline. Um, and finally, it uh, gives the right to recall. So um, right now, the um, NPC um, is the only body that has the authority to remove somebody from the NPC uh, for malfeasance or nonfeasance only. And so this would actually install the right to recall, um, meaning that if uh, members petition by um, a uh, petition of 1% of the entire membership um, or by 10% uh, of existing chapters to host a recall vote, um, then that would go to a vote um, and it would have to pass by 60% of members. So that's what that proposal is. Um, and that proposal um, did not pass. 23% uh, uh, voted uh, uh, in favor, I believe, or yeah, uh, I don't know percentages. It was 236 yes and 799 against. So someone who knows math can correct me there. Um, CB4 um, was about electing a national director. In other words, having the role that Maria Savari is currently in be an elected position um, that failed. Um, and then uh, we ended with recommendations for the NPC. The NPC released a series of recommendations, um, some of which were uh, just recommendations and some of which were actual changes to the DSA constitution or to the bylaws. Um, and uh, basically that was released within less than 30 days of the convention, which is the deadline that everyone else was given for any kind of changes and the deadline that they were given. So um, there was some opposition raised to that. Um, and given that they said that these, uh, these recommendations would not go into effect at this convention, they would be um, presented at the convention um, and so they were put on the agenda but they would not actually be voted on um, and put into practice until the 2023 convention. Uh, we only discussed the first three of those. Um, it was a long night. And with that, I'll give it over to Andy. Um, yeah, so, so the, uh, there, it, it's kind of bizarre because we spent, more time discussing like whether or not the convention would be um, located regionally or we would remove that than we did on the two um, like political resolutions on Thursday. So, um, you know, talking about the internationalism work got 15 minutes, but talking about um, whether or not the, the convention would be regionally bound ended up getting a half an hour because it had an amendment to it. So already a little bit bizarre. Um, that I mean, th th this is a pretty like no big deal amendment, the first one. Um, but uh, but the, the, the thing I think that was interesting when we we're looking at um, recall and um, transparency was the entire discussion was, um, was framed around like factionalism and people being extremely weary of um, the right to recall being used um, by political factions they didn't agree with. So to me, I think that, that what that says more than anything is people are already um, like, they're already kind of in this defensive posture where there's like, they, there is factionalism in the organization right now. It's not something that they're worried it will create, it exists now. And it's about whether they believe this would enable more of it or not. Um, personally, I don't think it would. I mean, like the largest caucuses are like less than 300 members, but, um, and so if you need a thousand signatures, there's, you know, you couldn't do that on your own, but whatever. Um, I think that that was an interesting kind of anxiety, right? A lot of the same stuff that happened at the last convention where people being worried about small chapters not getting their due um, what also was present in that debate. Um, and I, I think like, you know, it's, it's hard to say why people would swing one way or the other, but in general, I think there's a conservative attitude towards changing anything in the DSA constitution. So the same exact um, vote um, percentage happened between recall um, and the accountability resolution as did the one for electing DSA's national director, right? 
almost exactly the same vote totals. Um, and it's not the same people voting for them either, right? Like in general, I think um, more people like Bread and Roses people voted mostly against um, CB5, but voted for CB4, right? And so, but the same around 240 votes were carried on both sides. Um, so I think that there is um, just a lot of, um, people want to kind of hold a lot of these structural things at arm's length that they don't want to change the very much about the organization. And some of it, I think, is also about um, about this feeling like, do you want to be engrossed in this kind of stuff uh, more than you already are, right? One of the delegates that commented just basically said, this isn't fun. I don't want to do this. Um, you know, like, I, I think that all, all, all the political stuff is just factions and, um, you know, that's not why I want to be doing this, right? So, I mean, that's concerning too, because it's like, it, it basically says that, um, you know, that, that like people feel like the, all of the business is already kind of um, being handled uh, outside of them and they don't want like to see the open fighting or whatever. Um, but I think like what's really sad about it is that people have a hard time envisioning a DSA where that internal political life doesn't exist, right? That like, um, you know, we have a hard time imagining a healthy organization where we have like a good faith, like, okay, we have an issue and how are we going to deal with it? That everything is a motivated factional thing, which um, I don't think bodes very well for, for where DSA is at. Yeah, I think that um, at the beginning of the convention, when Rhea Spark gave her opening remarks, she basically talked about the importance of unity. Um, and, you know, obviously, like, unity for what purpose and what sake actually matters. I think that in a general way, we're all united by the desire for a socialist future, as the title of the convention suggests but all the strategic questions about the way to get there are political. And so to me that, you know, the, that becomes, you know, quote unquote factionalized in an unhealthy way when we don't have enough forums for debate and for us to actually understand each other's positions as comrades. Otherwise it just feels like a jockeying for power and it's more about who's gonna sit on the NPC or which proposals are gonna pass than it is actually about what is the content of those proposals? What is the content of those debates? And actually getting a sense that all members have the ability to shape that. Um, and so, yes, it's a headache to go through all these procedural motions. And the fact that, as Andy said, we spent so little time on the actual substance of debate, I think is part of why it's so frustrating for people. I think lots of people are finding this very hard to follow, um, very boring <laughs> uh, and tedious. And on the other hand, there's other things that have happened here that I think are very dispiriting. So, you know, um, regardless of um, uh, how the actual proposals, you know, have been framed or whatever, the debate on CB5 was a debate, or should have been a debate, in my opinion, about democratizing DSA, about actually having more people um, feel like they understand what the NPC is doing because it's more transparent, um, that they actually have the ability to check the NPC. Um, when they are not carrying out the will of the membership. Um, and instead, uh, the uh, debates against the fact that people were concerned about the threshold being so low, I think really reflects um, the fact that people can't envision um, good reasons on the part of their fellow DSA members for actually raising a debate, that it would only look like the factional kind of um, infighting um, or the less political infighting um, that's more personalistic that we've seen. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely part of the structures of DSA not facilitating debate. Um, another thing that unfortunately happened, I forgot to mention, um, is that um, there, you know, the Slack is one of the few places where you can have a debate right now. And the Slack was actually closed at one point. All of the various um, channels on Slack for each amendment um, <clears throat> where we were, you know, having these debates out were closed. And um, someone actually attempted uh, to raise that um, over stack during the convention. They were ruled out of order, but pretty soon after there was a single debate channel um, that was opened, which means that you can't follow the debates anymore about 
um, the specific proposals, um, you kind of have to all follow it in one channel. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, Slack is not a great facilitator of debate, but I think it was unfortunate that they chose to close it um, without any input from others. And now you can't see the previous debates. Um, to me, that speaks to the same issue. So um, the, the last thing on this really, um, I think was about um, the NPC's recommendations that they made. So um, the National Political Committee two weeks before the convention began released 44 pages of documents about their own recommendations that was just gonna be on the agenda. So everybody that had any proposals had to get signatures and had to do it by a certain time. The NPC said, well, we're a committee, so um, this is part of our committee resolution uh, recommendation, so that just gets on and included in there a number of constitution and bylaws changes. And the only reason why those are not being allowed in the convention is because the constitution of DSA right now says that you need um, a month before, you need to turn those in with a month's notice. So um, what they did was they said, okay, yeah, we can't debate those. Uh, we can't actually take any action on them, but all the same, we are gonna take up the remainder of Friday evening to discuss them and try to move them as resolutions that we, you know, we still are interested in, in the next NPC doing this, even though we can't codify it in the constitution. So, uh, which is a very weird thing to do, right? Um, but anyway, uh, I, I think at this point, like it, it became a, a really like, I, I had trouble following this to be totally honest, right? Which is that um, at at least three different points in the convention so far, people had raised objections to this, right? Like we should not be raising these. You did not follow the, the rules or, you know, um, and, and they've been ruled out of order or said that they have been resolved. And then we went and had this discussion anyway. And then they, they took each of these items as resolutions and, um, and then almost all of them passed by acclamation because they just said, if you object and we need a hundred objections, then we'll take a vote. And I think at that point, um, it's hard to like, again, get in people's heads about, did they love these things or, you know, were you just kind of like, whatever, fuck it. Right. Like, cause I know like at last convention, I had times where there were things where, um, you know, somebody might've had a good point, but it was just like, I'm tired of this. Right. Let's just move on. Um, so it's, it's always hard to separate those, but, but, um, that's where we've been in this convention. I think we still have to resolve the remainder of those recommendations. Um, but anyway, I, that, that's, that's the convention so far. Um, and it looks like we have some questions that people have asked. Um, this first one says, what do people think about this morning's keynote, keynote speaker, Dilma Rousseff, former president of Brazil? She's anti-choice and a pragmatic capitalist. Well, I think that in part, that's the result of, um, of having the orientation that was adopted through R14. So um, Dilma Rousseff was president of Brazil. Um, she was part of the PT. And, um, and so she's been invited to speak uh, as a keynote speaker to this DSA convention uh, and plays a very um, controversial role in Brazilian politics. Uh, maybe Haley, I don't know if you wanna weigh in on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that on the one hand, we have to recognize that Dilma Rousseff was imprisoned, that um, there is a very strong far right um, within Brazil, um, and that uh, that in and of itself is extremely disturbing and is a reason to, on principle, support, um, you know, obviously, like, this that shouldn't have happened this is a very dangerous thing for the left period for the entirety of the left across the spectrum um that that had happened um and so on that basis alone um Rousseff is considered a national hero on the other hand i think that looking to the question of um how did we get to this point you know i'm not an expert on brazilian politics but i know that the questions of what the left in power was doing to impose austerity 
definitely um, gave a gateway for the right to get a hearing within the wider um, left and even within the working class. Um, and so to me, you know, the idea that we would be completely uncritical and not be trying to follow the nuances of this debate um, and would just say, here's carte blanche, we completely support you, um, regardless of um, the positions you've taken that are not actually in support of the working class, I think that would be a really big mistake. Um, there are other um, you know, parts of uh, Resolution 14 that people argued well against, I think, um, around the question of internationalism, which is like, what does that mean to be in solidarity with, um, you know, or to rather to create alliances with Maduro rather than the opposition parties in Venezuela? What does that mean in the context of Ortega? What does that mean with AMLO in Mexico? There are a lot of um, contradictions there. And I think that um, those are things that, you know, need to be taken into consideration. Um, the other question I saw here, what would you say are the main differences between this convention and the last one in light of what has happened so far? So Andy would be better equipped to answer that one. The only thing I'll say really fast is that I think that, you know, my impression, um, uh, given that this is my first convention, is that the DSA convention is almost always dominated by procedural questions at the expense of political ones, and that that always um, has been a really big challenge. Yeah, so in some ways, there's a lot that's very similar, right? Like um, the last convention uh, was way behind because of all kinds of procedural fuckery. This one's way behind because of procedural fuckery. Same thing, right? Um, the last convention, people released a number of letters, like just trying to um, like invalidate NPC candidates. There was three last time. There was one this time, right? Like that. That that's like these are like actually. Um, it's become a kind of pattern that some of this stuff is going to happen, right? Um, I think that what feels very different about this convention is that in my opinion, the last convention felt like the, the committee was more neutral about what was going to happen, right? That um, they put something out and that the body kind of had to move um, where they wanted to go. It didn't feel like things were absolutely skewed in one direction or the other one. This one feels a lot more like it's on rails, right? Like um, there's a lot of stuff that's being ruled out of order and, um, and, and just things that seem like they're, they're just um, getting railroaded, right? Um, so like the, the actual particulars of doing an online convention, like nobody can deny that's way harder. And I have a lot of sympathy for, um, for trying to run a big um, convention this way, right? There's, there's no easy way to do it. All kinds of problems are gonna exist, right? The things that I think I'm more critical about is that a lot of this is stuff that you could predict, right? Like if everything has taken, like if we've run over time with um, with credentials objections and agenda items and all kinds of procedural shit, two conventions in a row, you can expect it's going to happen the third time, right? So um, like when you're building out an agenda to say, uh, how long is this going to take? everybody should know it's going to take more than 30 minutes to resolve this, right? That like that should have been built into the structure. And as a result, the expectations about what's going to happen um, would be adjusted. But here, like everybody is going to get very frustrated and put on edge because you're kind of expecting like, well, my resolution is at the end of the day on Sunday and we should get to it because they said, no, it's actually going to get pushed now, right? Like stuff like that, I think is, is frustrating. Um, and uh, like the the whole actual process of being able to to weigh in is is really really different right like the difference between being on the floor and getting to a mic and you know raising your objection right N everybody can see you right there's no way that you can ignore that in this case we have six different browser windows open where you have to select the correct motion, right? And then you have a staff member who's curating them to determine whether that's the appropriate thing to be heard or not for the, for the chair to then even recognize, creates like three layers between you and them. So that is extremely alienating and difficult. Um, and then, uh, and then on top of it, right? Like uh, most of like parliamentary procedure, you just like, raise your hand and everybody can just get a quick look how many hands were up okay that passes right but because um they they put everything to be a roll call vote for this convention there's like no mechanism to quickly resolve things so everything is taking forever um 
so those, those are the things that that seem really different. Um, I mean, I applaud them putting the convention stuff or the constitution things at the beginning of the convention rather than the end, because it can only be heard at this, this convention, right? Like uh, the NPC cannot make constitution or bylaws changes, only the convention can do that. So last time a bunch of shit got booted, um, this time they put it at the front, right? Um, it's good because there's no other time to do it. It's bad because then the whole tone of the convention feels very procedural and apolitical. So um, hopefully that that's helpful. Um, I, I generally feel like this the, the feeling of this thing feels a lot more like most of the stuff feels like it's been decided in advance and we're here. And, you know, if you're going to raise an objection, you better raise hell um, by, you know, a lot of stuff. Like, like I said, like three different people raising objections to the NPC, even bringing up their recommendations and that just getting like, you know, brushed aside. Yeah, there's another question. Um, how many other delegates are frustrated with the lack of explicit political discussion of substance? And um, I'm actually going to read one of the comments because uh, I think that it speaks to this. I found that in my DSA chapter that the lack of political discussions and debates in organizational life means that all political differences are regular being resolved, quote unquote, through interpersonal conflict, hyper attentiveness to chapter bylaws and grievance procedures. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think I think that that's pretty much speaks to why people are frustrated to some extent. I don't know if everybody is seeing it as substance or not for the reasons that I said before. I think some people, um, you know, see all of it as just kind of general infighting and would like to see us just kind of be on the same page. Um, whereas to me, debate is actually a way for us to get to the same page or to get closer to the same page um, because we actually outline what the terms of the debate are rather than it being couched in proceduralism. Um, the procedures are usually a proxy for other debates that aren't happening. Um, or they're, you know, uh, as Andy suggests, like a way to kind of shut down debate. Like I think that um, the fact that people tried to raise objections to these NPC resolutions, which by the way, I just want to say, I don't think a lot of people had time to even read um, and digest and decide what they thought of, much less to raise objections to because of the time frame that was given. So it's really bad and undemocratic, and I don't say that word lightly, that the NPC is allowed to just kind of decide we're going to uh, we're going to read these things anyway and discuss them at the expense of other things that people have raised, um, and we've actually had time to some extent to debate and discuss, uh, I think that's a real problem. Um, but I think people are mostly frustrated because what the proceduralism does too is it's almost like a test of will, like how long are you able to like outlast the other person um, because of how long things are going and how annoying and frustrating it is. Um, every time someone calls the question, it's like we have to wait another five minutes for the roll call vote to go in. So it's like by the time you get to stuff of you know, any substance whatsoever, people are tired. Um, and it's almost like if you have a real issue to raise um, because something was not done properly or whatever, it's like, oh, that person who raised that objection, it doesn't matter whether it was a good objection or a bad objection, it's prolonging things. So that becomes the basis on which I think people are, um, are frustrated or worse, it might be the basis on which people are voting late in the night. But I think that, um, I think that that's all caused, you know, undue frustration. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, like uh, through Thursday, and I'd say even into part of Friday, every motion took about 25 minutes to resolve, right? So anytime someone called the question, it was 25 minutes of us, you know, getting the vote up, voting, waiting for it to be resolved, then having issues with it and then waiting for it. So this is 25 minutes where people are just sitting, right? And then trying to click through a website and then waiting for the result and then being told what the result is and then picking back up. So it can be used to obstruct things. And I think that in my opinion, that's what happened with resolution 14 is that it was, uh, there were all kinds of procedural motions to obstruct the debate. Um, and somebody asked the question, was it passed? Yes, it was passed, right? So it was two to one. Um, people 
did pass resolution 14 there was a debate on it and and ultimately it passed um the the issue about um like political substance too is like part of this is um this convention has focused a lot on like consensus building so there are multiple resolutions where they try to achieve consensus and the issue is that there isn't consensus on a lot of these things like there's actual debates that are happening and part of this is like even in a democratic organization right like uh even if you lose right you want to get the impression that that uh your your objections were heard and thought and meaningfully considered right and if they're if they're just rejected right it it, it uh, weakens your confidence in the organization right um uh, and I, I think that 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 is something that feels like it's happening in this one right there's um there's not a lot of political space for these things. And so they are spilling over into procedural things and into personalistic attacks. And if they were actually constructed as political debates, we could have them out and do it constructively um, without getting into, uh, into like the nastiness that's, that's um, come up. Yeah, I mean, I'm also just thinking generally, like how alienated people are from what happens nationally in DSA, how difficult that is to actually plug into and be able to feel like what you, you know, what your input is matters or that you can actually understand it. Um, I think part of what all of this stuff does is it makes it really, really, really opaque and makes it really, really difficult to, um, to feel like this stuff matters very much. Um, because if, if this is what we sign up for as delegates to go through, I mean, right now there are how many, um, 16 NPC positions. And like, even before um, uh, multiple NPC uh, candidates, even before they dropped out, it was a pretty low number ultimately that were running for those positions. Um, because I think they know what they're getting in for. And they also uh, know that you know, this is sort of how the organization works. So there are people who, you know, run because they know that the NPC has enormous control. And on the other hand, it's so removed from what happens at the local level with chapters or anything else um, that, you know, and when the convention happens this way, um, where we don't actually hear more about what was being done, I, I kind of would have loved to hear more reports, not necessarily on uh, what the NPC recommends, but on what they were doing and what they uh, seek to do going forward. Even the platform that they put out was so broad, it seemed much more about getting consensus from the organization than about what they actually think are the political priorities um, for the next two years if DSA is going to be a real political force. Yeah, um, I'm trying to see if there's any other questions, but it looks like right now we've we've taken them um, as they've come. Um, yeah, um, so where we're going to be for the next few days is um, today is going to continue um, one the MPC recommendations and then some of the constitutional amendments, but then it's going to get into the platform. Um, so the political platform and the amendments that have been proposed are going to be addressed today. Um, this evening, the the vote for NPC opens, um, and if I I think it, it's either 19 or 20 candidates right now for uh, 16 positions, so um, it's not a very robust uh, election, right? Um, like you've got like a 75 percent chance of being elected without any politics even factoring in, um, and then um, tomorrow will. I think resolve the the platform and then take up the resolutions. So um, that's that's where we're at for the convention. Um, we're planning on doing another one of these on Monday evening to to do the convention wrap up of what happened and the results. Um, but unless you got anything else, Haley. Actually, I do. Um, you know, just because we have a couple minutes left, I sort of have my own question. I'm kind of uh, throwing this. I'm putting you on the spot, Andy, but. Uh, you know, because I think it's discouraging to see all this stuff happening and it, it lowers confidence in the organization. I mean, what do you think would have to change actually for DSA to become the kind of organization that would actually facilitate these kinds of uh, discussions that would actually 
avoid the interpersonal kind of conflict and, you know, draw out real debates. Um, I, I think that to me, one of the biggest issues with the convention, and this is true of the last convention too, is that we waived the entire pre-convention period, right? That actually, right, like I, I agree, there's not enough time to do everything that we need in the convention itself. Um, but we had a pre-convention period of about eight months, right? Where we could have been having these political discussions in a structured way, right? And actually been raising them and uh, and have them be led in part by the national leadership if that was worthwhile. Um, and, and that I think could have helped us get to this moment in a, in a way that everybody was more prepared, right? That they understood what the positions were, that they understood what the major questions are. Um, I mean, what happened at the last convention um, was that a lot of people, like there, there were three times as many proposals last time and most people had not read all of them or even some of them, right? So a lot of people came in and were listening on the floor to what did they think? And then that was their entire um, orientation to how they should vote, um, which I think is, it, it's, a, it's an issue, right? I mean, like, yeah, it's a, it's a big commitment to be a delegate but there are things that the organization can do to make that easier, right? Um, and, and I think that that does require some active intervention on the part of the national organization to say, um, okay, like here, here is the political situation that we're in, right? And like, give us a framing of that. Um, I don't think that it existed this time, right? Like we, we didn't get any kind of, um, of, of perspective about, about the state of politics in the world or in the US or you know what our challenges socialists are right now um, that that could have really helped us out so so that's one thing um, I think that um, there's a kind of fidelity to Robert's rules that I think um, should be re-examined right like like everybody uh, wants to have fair rules, right? Like something that we can all understand and use and then that the rules facilitate the debate and the politics. Right now, I don't think that that's what happened, right? Like if we're being totally honest, I think that some people are Robert's Rules wizards and um, other people are, are just kind of like, what is happening? Like, you know, I don't understand why this motion is being made or what that does. Like that, that's not entirely clear and it's not really helping us get to the, to the crux of the issue. Um, so I'm not gonna say like cultural change is overwhelmingly because I don't think that's sufficient. I mean, like culturally, yeah, I think that we need to, you know, be serious about listening to, um, to opposing views on stuff. And like our attitude towards decision-making actually has to be that I'm here to convince people or not that I'm right and I'm gonna shut out the opposition, right? Um, that's why I voted for um, when somebody made the motion that if something gets pulled off the consent agenda that we that it gets debated, right? I was like, I agree, let's debate it, right? Um, so I, I think those are some of the things I, I, I think like the, we have to actually create a lot of those those spaces, right? Like DSA doesn't have some like, I mean, we have socialist forum, but it's it's very, very limited, right? Like it, it doesn't DSA doesn't feel like an organization where um, where we try to have a lot of discussion. Like a lot of the stuff that comes from the national is one way communication. This is what we're doing, right? And it's almost always triumphal, right? Like we made a million phone calls. Okay. Like, but we didn't actually talk about how we got there or why we decided that, or, I mean, and like, I, I don't mean that to be paralyzing, right? Like, I know some people are like, well, we can't just talk all the time. We have to do stuff, but like, I don't think that's the point, right? The point is that we do do stuff, but then we're, we feel confident and we're bringing it along. We're bringing people along the way and, uh, and we're doing the best things we can do. Yeah, I really agree with all of that. Um, yeah, I think the, I think you're right that uh, cultural changes uh, only go so far, but I think that when I think about how we prepare for conventions in the future, I think every local, every chapter has to really fight for a pre-convention period that is um, open to debate, um, that is actually um, structured in a way where we have real assessments of what we've done right and what we've done wrong, that we report on what the chapter has done, not in a triumphalist way, um, but in a way that actually clarifies 
you know, what are the challenges that still exist and what we still need to do and what are the deficiencies, what are the debates that exist around strategy? Because really, if we don't have those debates after a while, people vote with their feet and people get discouraged and don't actually participate um, because they don't uh, see this as a place that's actually a political home for them to help shape. Um, so I think that that's at least one thing um, concretely that we can do in the future. But I also think that if we don't hold um, the NPC to actually adhere by the democracy of DSA, if we don't democratize DSA um, even more so, um, then that's going to be a real dead end for whether this is a robust organization in the future. So I see the stakes as very high as to whether that can happen or not. Um, and if it can't, then I think we have to really evaluate the kind of organization we want to have. Um, so, you know, um, I, I don't know how optimistic or pessimistic to be about that. I think, as Andy said, like, this convention um, was very decided in advance in some ways that it was gonna go very much the way it's gone before. Um, but I think that if people are frustrated with that, we actually have to mobilize and organize opposition and be vocal. So the whole idea that politics is just for factions, I think that's false. I think we have to reject that and actually say politics is for all of us and we all should be active and have a say in that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, and if people don't like our commentary, like, I, I seriously wish that more people would put their own out, right? Like, um, that, that to me is like a little bit of the deficit here is that who's even reporting on what's happening right now? It's like, um, it's pretty quiet. So I think that, that that's part of the issue is that often this stuff is seen as too delicate and you don't want someone to know what you think because you're afraid that they're going to disagree with you. And it's also like, it's like, we have to we actually have to have a good understanding of what's going on and and put out you know like a a, a bunch of different takes on what's going on like i'm sure that some comrades are like oh um you know the the way that this debate went down was stupid and the this never should have happened and, and i'd love for them to make their case right but the problem is the silence i think more than anything so um you know we'll, we'll do another one of these on monday like i said but um but you know, I, I hope that um, it's an invitation to other people to to do some reporting and talk about what's going on. And... Yep, absolutely. So I think we're done done here. Yeah. All right, comrades. All right. Take care. Thanks, we'll see you. Bye. All right.